No, uh, uh, this is oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 Y
don't forget that. Don't forget to bring your favorite dishes. Um, let's see, volunteers. Volunteers are needed for the meet and greet, uh, to host the meet and greet, bring some, uh, some goodies and that kind of thing. Uh, Lori Glass is the person to see about that. And also, uh, Carol Bass asks that you consider uh, signing up for ushers, being an usher and or greeter, and greeter. Uh, if you have some time available, see Carol about that. Caroline. Caroline, sorry. Um, there is, in the back, I mentioned last week also, there's a new uh, complaint, complaint and suggestion form that's been put together. Um, Laura gave me this prop to show you. This is what it looks like. I hadn't seen it before. My only initial thought, Laura, is that there may not be enough room here to list, to list everything that needs to be listed. Well, that'll listed. come on the complaints, and you can use the <laughs> Complaint, make the, make the suggestion form longer. Yeah. That's a good one. So those are, those are in the back if you want to have any thoughts that you want to share and through council and uh, have some attention placed. So let's see. Um, our own Cindy Brewer, this one here at the piano, is organizing a really fun gospel sing-along on February 25th. It's a Saturday uh, right here at LCF. And this next thing I'm going to read is written by Cindy, and it's going to be placed, placed on the information on, online. The sing-along will consist of a solo, a duet, a mixed quartet, choir anthems, and instrumentals interspersed with several cherished gospel favorites, near and dear to our hearts. Everyone will be invited to sing and clap along to create a joyful, informal, and energetic, energetic event. So please plan to come and please promote the fun event to your friends. You'll find postings on our Facebook page. It's there. Chuck put it there last night. Uh, there's also information on our website and a link to um, this, speaking of props, which you'll find these posted around. And uh, if you'd like a hard copy of this to share with your friends uh, or your circle of friends, neighbors, uh, see me and I can get a, get a copy of that to you. So plan on that for February 25th. And I got a lot of food, but I didn't eat it myself. <laughs> well, okay. Okay. Yeah, she keeps... She, what time is it? time is it? Three o'clock, right? Yeah. Three o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. Any other announcements? Yes. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> yeah. On February the 14th, coming up, uh, the Twilight <laughs> Concert, the, la the last one of the season at the Villa Antonia. I don't know how, how if, if all of you know about the, the uh, Twilight Concert Series that's held there. They do six a year, and the last one is involving yours truly. And it's a very special one because um, I'm pulling together, I have pulled together 12 very, very highly professional string players, six violins, three violas, two cellos, and a bass. And we're gonna be doing two serenades, one's Dvorak and the other one is Tchaikovsky and uh, some other beautiful things. You really don't wanna miss this one. This is gonna be Valentine's night, Valentine's night, the 14th at 7.30. You come, the villa, you come at 6.30, bring wine, cheese, crackers, whatever you wanna nibble on. And in the intermission, there's more nibblies and then more gorgeous music. And it's a really a beautiful night. Uh, just look up, if you don't know where the Villa Antonia is, just look it up uh, on, uh, online and it'll give you the directions to get there. It's a beautiful place, don't miss it. This one will be a concert for our area for the ages. You really don't wanna miss what it. What time is it? 7.30. What was that? You can buy them at the door. Uh, I don't know if there's another way to get one. Yeah. There is? Online. Oh, online. Online. Okay, so look up Twilight Concerts online, the Villa Antonia, 
and I think you'll find where to buy the tickets there. Okay, but I'm you're pretty sure you can just go to the door, and, and I know you can because I've done it myself. All right, okay. see you there. One final thing before the, the prelude, I uh, want to welcome our YouTube streamers. I'm glad you're with us this morning virtually. And anytime you're able to think about coming in in person, we'd love to have you in the seats here as well. All right, so. <laughs> Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Loving God, we confess that we have sinned. Even though we want to do what is right, we did not always succeed this week. Not only did we fail to do what was right, but at times we consciously chose to think and act in ways we knew were wrong. We are truly sorry, and we ask for your forgiveness. Remain standing for the hymn of praise 380 in your hymnals. Verses 1, verses one 3, and 5. Please be seated. I tell you what, this cedar fever, I don't know if you can tell by my voice. <laughs> uh, I could join the choir as a bass, but it would be only for today. Uh, but uh, anyway, 
Boy, I, I, I beg your pardon? <laughs> it sound better? Oh, that's good. It's good. I sound like Rick. Anyway, I uh, understand, uh, I was told this morning uh, that many of you know Paul Thomas, lifelong resident of Lago Vista. He's been here a long time. Well, Paul sadly passed away um, uh, sometime this week, and so keep Benita and the family in your prayers. I also understand that um, Betty Houghton's daughter, Kathy Thomas, has been tested positive for COVID. Uh, this is not over yet. Uh, it's going to keep hanging around and hanging around. Fortunately, um, if you keep up with your vaccinations and boosters and stuff like that, that I understand that it's not uh, as uh, bad as it could be that those uh, vaccinations and those shots do mitigate uh, the uh, symptoms somewhat. So I know that uh, Lance, didn't you have, weren't you tested COVID last week? So you're doing okay? Everything's okay. Carolyn, you doing all right? All right, good, good. Praise reports. Sharon Kilo, good to see you. How'd that surgery go? Went well? Good to see you, good to see you. Um, Bert Bichette is home out of the hospital. Uh, he's recovering, but there's still a long way to go. Um, he has multiple um, uh, illnesses uh, in, his, in his system uh, that keep compounding on each other. Um, and he was in the hospital for about a week. And uh, they, got the, they found the cause of uh, the blood. Uh, that was leaking, and so they've fixed that. So, but he um, uh, he needs to have a device installed um, that um, uh, keeps track of uh, blood flow and prevents clots. In other words, it takes the place of any kind of um, blood thinners. And so he's reached a point that he needs that inserted into his heart. And that is very serious business. So I talked with Margie, and uh, I'm sure Bert's listening, so get well soon, buddy. Uh, we're praying for you. Um, they haven't set that appointment up to do that procedure, but we'll keep you, we'll keep you posted. Um, Ed Smith uh, was on our prayer list for some, uh, for some time over the past year. Um, uh, Wilma Sanders uh, called and said that he passed away and to keep her sister, Gloria McHale, who is the widow of Ed, uh, in your prayers. So I uh, wanted to bring you uh, up to date uh, with that. Um, are there any others that... Uh, I have failed to mention that God has placed in your heart. Well, why don't we take a moment of silent prayer, uh, lifting up those that, uh, that we've mentioned here this morning and also those that God has put on your hearts. Father God, we uh, always come to your throne of grace, first of all, for your love and for all the things that you do for us. But Father, be with those that we have mentioned here this morning. And Father God, there's a whole bunch of people out there that are that are under the weather, uh, fighting allergies or COVID or any number of uh, uh, illnesses. And Father, we just pray your, uh, your blessings on them. And Father, just be with uh, those um, in areas of this country who have um, seen the mighty power of nature. 
those people who have lost their lives and those that are still battling uh, the mudslides and the, and the rain. Um, be with them, be with their families, and be with the folks that are uh, in Ukraine still fighting for their freedom, to retain their freedom. And Father God, we just place them in your throne of grace. And as we close this time of prayer, may we do so with the prayer that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Bill? This morning's scripture is Romans chapter 7, verses 20 through 25, which you can find in your bulletin. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not, not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me co covertly rebel. And just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. At the end, I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? 
Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in his life of contradictions, where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but, I'm, but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Bill, and the choir. Bill and I were talking this past week, and I told him, I said, you know, um, that the music ministry in this church is probably the greatest music ministry, at least in this community and this area. And it is uh, through the graces of Bill and Cindy and this marvelous choir uh, that meets every week um, to bring the word of God to you through music. And it is, I am in awe every time I hear you sing. Well, have you ever battled for control of your life? <laughs> Some of us fight that battle every day of the week. I found myself in that battle the last couple of months of 2022. You went through it with me, and thank God for your prayers and support that's behind us now. I also thank God each day and for my wife and family who supports me and encourages me in my ministry. Yet the discouraging truth, however, is that our main adversary is not someone in our family or someone at work or someone who is angry at us. So as Pogo once put it, we have met the enemy and he is us. We all battle for control. I was encouraged to read somewhere that the French writer Victor Hugo, author of the book Les Miserables, is based, he had a habit of asking his servant to steal his clothes every morning. And this meant that Hugo could not go outside and so was forced to carry on with his writing. Cecilius a disciple of Plato was on a ship that sank at sea, and somehow he survived, and when he reached home, he ordered his servants to wall up the two windows of his home, which looked out over the vast Mediterranean Sea. He didn't want to look on those waters some beautiful summer day and even be tempted to venture out again. Battling for control. A little boy scraped a chair across the kitchen floor and cried, climbed on it to reach the cookie jar at the top shelf. His mother heard the noise and called out, what are you doing in there? And with his hand in the cookie jar, the child replied, I'm fighting temptation. battling for control. It's been said that there are only two pains in life. The pain of discipline and the pain of regret. And that discipline weighs ounces while regret weighs tons. You see, there's, there are many of us who can sympathize with St. Paul when he writes these words, something has gone wrong deep inside me. And, and, and gets the better of me every time. 
It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. Can they be a more relevant passage of Scripture for many of us? The battle for control. Plato once said, for a man to conquer himself is the first and noblest of all virtues. The writer John Milton put it like this, he who reigns within himself rules his passion, desires, and fears is more than a king. question is, how is it done? How do we become more than kings? How do we win the battle for control of our own desires and actions and thereby listen to what God desires from us? I have some ideas. First of all, we begin by acknowledging, acknowledging that we are on our own. Nobody on this earth can do it for us. The battle is our own. Nobody can fight it for us. You can lead a, water, a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. He has to want to drink. This doesn't mean that the world does not lure us. A familiar ploy of slave traders before the Civil War was to lure unsuspecting Africans onto ships by using a red cloth. It was familiar among the slaves. A group of children would be playing, and they saw the red flag flying at a distance, and they became curious as to what the red flag is and, and ran to it on approaching. They, grabbed, they were grabbed by uh, some, some men and put on a ship, and this ship took them to Virginia where they are sold. And one former slave said that she always hated anything red because that was the color used to lure her forever from her homeland. She often was heard saying, oh, that red rag, that red rag brought me here. There are many red flags in the world that lure us. Some believe that's the origin of the phrase waving a red flag. It's a warning of a bad, a bad situation or an event. If you watch the weather, the weather casters will say, it's a red flag warning. That's where it comes from. Long time ago. The decision to give in to their lure, however, is our own. Anthony Evans, in preaching today, tells a great story about a forester named Sam. Old Sam would be out chopping a tree, chopping trees down. You could hear him say one phrase over and over again, oh, Adam, oh, Adam. Every time he hit that tree, he'd say, oh, Adam. One day, the foreman came up and asked him, how come every time you hit the tree, you say, oh, Adam? Sam said, because Adam, my forefather, sinned against God. God cursed him and said that he would have to work from that time on. So every time I hit this axe against that tree, it reminds me that if Adam hadn't sinned, I wouldn't have to work. <laughs> then one day, the supervisor walked up to old Sam, and he said, come here. I want to show you something. And he took Sam to this Big, plush, palatial, 10,000-square-foot mansion. And he said to Sam, it's all yours. You can live in it. You can do whatever you want. You've got a swimming pool, a tennis court, servants every, everywhere. Everything in this house is yours. 
I'm giving it to you because I don't want you to struggle with that Adam mentality anymore. I ask only one thing. There's a box on the dining room table. Don't touch that box. Sam said, that's no biggie. I can do that. Piece of cake. Then one day, the supervisor came and looked. And Sam said, I'm doing all right, boss. I'm doing okay. I, I haven't touched that box. And I'm having a good time. I don't have to work for anything. Five months went by. <laughs> he saw that box every day. That bothered him. He wanted to know why that box was so important, but he resolved not to, not to touch it. And after a year, <laughs> he tried everything that there was to try. He had, it, he had gotten used to everything. There was nothing new anymore. There was only one thing new in that house, and it was that box. So one day when nobody was looking, old Sam walked up to that dining room table, lifted that box just a little bit, and out of that box ran a little teeny mouse that hid, and Sam couldn't catch it. He couldn't find it. The supervisor came and noted that the box had been lifted. He went to Sam and said, Now, Sam, I warned you, go back to the forest and pick up your axe and chop again. And so the next time the supervisor came by, he heard Sam saying, Oh, Sam, oh, Sam. <laughs> you see, Sam couldn't blame his predicament on Adam anymore. Only on Sam, only on himself. The lesson is that if we are to win the battle for control, first of all, we need to recognize that we, we can't do it alone. And then secondly, we begin to win the battle when we acknowledge that we can do better. We are not genetically defective. We are not hopeless cases. We are capable, competent, conscientious uh, folks who, who have been fashioned in the image of our creator. And this means that we have the power of choice. We can decide and we can follow through with our decisions. A man went into Saks Fifth Avenue, New York City, to buy some pajamas. He noticed uh, on the pajamas a label that said shrink resistant. And he wondered, well, what does that mean? Do they shrink or don't they? So he went up to the clerk and he said, what does it mean when a garment says shrink resistant? Does it shrink or not? The sales lady said, sir, it means that it will shrink. And then she paused, but it really doesn't want to. <laughs> You and I are not a pair of pajamas. We're free moral agents. We can decide. We can set goals. We can do better. Paul uh, Charlop puts it this way. He says that everybody should spend a year in the Marines. Then we would learn that we can march that extra 15 miles with a pack on our back. That's discipline, he says like a checklist in your head. If you're a salesman, for example, you say to yourself the night before, I'm going to do this amount of work, I'm going to make this number of calls, or I'm going to knock on this many doors and to do this number of demonstrations, and you don't go home until you do it. And then after a while, it becomes automatic. At a level when somebody else has to put out all kinds of effort, you pass by like it was nothing. That's one man's experience. Most of us have never been Marines. 
We don't possess that kind of trained expertise. But we can be, do better than we're doing. We can take one small step at a time with our eye firmly fixed on the man or woman God has created us to be. The battle will never be easy, but it can happen. We can do better if we put our minds to it. And then finally, we're more fortunate than most people in the world. We have a divine ally. Dr. Kenneth McFarlane was a superintendent of schools many years ago. And he had, under his supervision, the Coffeyville Junior College. And it was the day before their annual commencement exercises. And a young lady came into his office, and he recognized her uh, as one of those ready to graduate. She was an honor student, a bright, attractive girl. Her name was Nancy Hollingsworth. And Nancy told Dr. McFarlane, a fascinating story. It seems her father was killed when she was a small child. Her mother worked in a factory to support her and her two brothers. Her only other living relative was Uncle Ben. And Uncle Ben had a drinking problem. So one night while Nancy, Jim, and Tommy were still children, their mother died very unexpectedly. Uncle Ben came to the house. The children asked him, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? So Uncle Ben answered, I love you, kids. I'm going to go down to the court and make them to believe that you can be placed in my custody. And so he did. So he did. So he told the kids, I'll get down on my knees every night and I'll pray and ask God to raise you right. And Nancy told Dr. McFarlane, Uncle Ben hasn't had a drink since and he hasn't missed a day of work. My brother Jim graduated from medical school. Tommy's graduating from MIT this spring. I'm going to go to teacher's college and tomorrow night will be six commencements Uncle Ben has attended. There's only one problem. He won't sit in the parents' section. He feels it will show disrespect for my mother. So she asked, could you mention something about Uncle Ben at the commencement? Dr. McFarland said, yes, and he did. And when McFarland finished, there was a standing ovation from all of the members of that class and all of the members in attendance as he called for Uncle Ben to come forward and be recognized. McFarlane asked Uncle Ben this question. When you went down to court that day, obviously, you didn't have a very good case, as I understand it. He said, what did you tell the judge? I'm curious. Uncle Ben said, you're right. I scared to death, and when the judge asked me what I thought the, uh, when I thought the, why I thought the children could come and live with me, I said to the judge that Jesus said a man can be born again. He can change. He can change completely, and he can stay chained. And I believe the master, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, meant every man, any man, and even a drunk, ne'er-do-well uncle. And I believe that when the master said, whosoever will, I believe he included me. The judge looked at him for a long time and said, I believe that deal does include you, Ben. I'm going to let you take the children for 30 days. 
and then we'll come and visit and see how you're doing. The kids and I got home, Uncle Ben said, and we got down on our knees. And I promised God that if he, he'd hold me on to uh, if he'd hold on to me, I would hold on to the kids. And the five of us have been going along together all of these years. So you see, folks, that's how it works. There's a battle going on within each of us, and we just have to remember that nobody can fight the battle for us. We must do it for ourselves, and that is the battle we can win because we are children of the King. It's a gospel song that says, oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm a child of the king. His royal blood now flows through my veins. And I who was lost and poured down can sing. Praise God. Praise God. I'm a child. name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of response this morning is 349, and it's a chorus, and you've sung it many times. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's all you need to do. So would you stand and sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Apostles' Creed and say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you please be seated as the ushers come forward for the tithes and offerings.
Rise, please. Accept these gifts so freely given. May they be used to, um, to glorify your kingdom throughout this community and around the world. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. That's all he wants. He wants you to say, okay, I give it to you. And I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to spread it to everybody I meet. That's what he wants from you. It's hymn number 382. Am I right? Mm -hmm. wrote in the in Romans um, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and place in believing and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in love and all God's people said amen, amen.